As in the vigilance of the sleepless night, through the slow, heavy-footed, silent hours, repressing in her bosom its load of grief, she sat staring at the dumb tread of time and the approach of ever nearing fate. A summons from her being's summit came. A sound, a call that broke the seals of night. Above her brows, where will and knowledge meet, a mighty voice invaded mortal space. It seemed to come from inaccessible heights and yet was intimate with all the world and knew the meaning of the steps of time and saw eternal destinies changeless seen filling the far prospect of the cosmic gaze. As the voice touched, her body became a stark and rigid golden statue of motionless trance, a stone of God lit by an amethyst soul. Around her body's stillness, all grew still. Her heart listened to its slow, measured beats. Her mind, renouncing thought, heard and was mute. Why camest thou to this dumb, death-bound earth, this ignorant life beneath indifferent skies, tied like a sacrifice on the altar of time? O oh, spirit, O oh, immortal energy, if twas to nurse grief in a helpless heart, or with hard, tearless eyes await thy doom. Arise, O oh soul, and vanquish time and death. But Savitri's heart replied in the dim night, My strength is taken from me and given to death. Why should I lift my hands to the shut heavens or struggle with mute inevitable fate or hope in vain to uplift an ignorant race who hug their lot and mock the Saviour light and see in mind wisdom's soul tabernacle 
in its harsh peak and its inconscient base a rock of safety and an anchor of sleep Is there a God whom any cry can move? He sits in peace and leaves the mortal strength impotent against his calm, omnipotent law and inconscience and the almighty hands of death. What need have I, what need has Satyavan to avoid the black meshed net, the dismal door, or call a mightier light into life's closed room, a greater law into man's little world. Why should I strive with earth's unyielding laws or stave off death's inevitable hour? This surely is best to pactize with my fate and follow close behind my lover's steps and pass through night from twilight to the sun across the tenebrous river that divides the adjoining parishes of earth and heaven. Then could we lie inarmed, breast upon breast, untroubled by thought, untroubled by our hearts, forgetting man and life and time and its hours, forgetting eternity's call, forgetting God. Rosa. Mm -hmm. As in the vigilance of the sleepless night, to the slow, heavy foot, silent house, replacing in her bosom its load of grief, she said, staring at the dumb creed of time and the approach of ever nearing fate that someone summons from the from her beings summit came a sound a call the drop the seals of night. Hmm, thank you. Savitri is awake in the night. She is sleepless. She is keeping a vigil. A vigil is when we stay awake at night to keep watch for some reason. It may be to prepare ourselves for some uh, great ordeal that will come the next day or it may be uh, sometimes when somebody has died his family will sit around and stay awake in the night, a vigil. So vigilance means watchfulness in the vigilance of the sleepless night through the slow, heavy-footed, silent hours. So many hours 
She is staying awake and the hours pass slowly and it's as if they pass with a heavy tread, a heavy hearted tread. But he says heavy footed as if there's a sound of the heavy footed passing of the hours. And all that time she's repressing in her bosom, in her heart, its load of grief. She won't allow that grief to come out and express itself. Instead, she sits open-eyed, staring at the dumb tread of time, the passage of time. And every hour that passes is bringing nearer the fate, Satyavan's fate, that's coming. With every moment, it is coming nearer and nearer. So as she's sitting there, silent, wakeful, in the night, a summons came. A summons is when somebody calls you from her being's summit. It comes from the topmost level of her being. It's a sound, it's a call, and that call, he says, broke the seals of night. Night with a capital N. So then we think of the night of unconsciousness. That night of unconsciousness keeps things <coughs> closed. We seal an envelope, no? We seal a private message. So something has been sealed up, closed, but that seal is broken by the sound of that voice. Is it from the same day Satyavan is going today or previously this happened? No, this is in the flashback. The day that uh, Satyavan is, must die that is told about in Cantos 1 and 2. And then we don't hear anything more about it until Book 8. So this is all part of the... In the film we have a flashback. No? We see what's going to happen at the end and then we go back to the beginning. So this is still part of that preparation for that day. Martin. Above her brows, the will and knowledge meet. The mighty voice invaded mortal space. It seemed to come from <coughs> inaccessible heights, and yet was intimate with all the world and knew the meaning of the steps of time. And so eternal destinies changed the scene, feeling the far prospect of the cosmic case. So it's as if that voice comes down into this space here, the brow. These are our eyebrows, and also above her eyebrows, here where will and knowledge meet. This is the place of the, the third eye. No? It's also where the power of will is seated. So here there's the meeting place of will and knowledge. So that's where the voice seems to come to. It seems to invade from the heights to come into mortal space. And that voice, it seems to come from these heights that are inaccessible. We can't reach them, they are too far away. And yet, at the same time, it is intimate with all the world. It seems familiar, close to all the world. 
It seems to know everything about this world. It seems to know the meaning of the steps of time. We don't know that. No? We are usually quite unaware of the meaning of the steps of time. But uh, that voice seems to know that. And it seems to have a power of vision that it's uh, aware of eternal destinies, changeless seen, what has been determined forever from eternity. And that's filling the far prospect of the cosmic gaze. A prospect, I have a nice prospect here. I can look between the heads of Bebel and um, <laughs> Suresh and look out and there's a, a view of a beautiful sunlit garden. A prospect is a view. But this is the far prospect of the cosmic gaze. What does the universal spirit see? It sees far, far into the future. It sees all the way to the fulfillment of the manifestation. Sergei. As the voice touched, the body became a star and it reached a golden state of motionless clouds. A star of God lived by an amethyst soul. Yes. So uh, her body responds to the touch of this voice. It becomes absolutely still, unmoving. And because she has this lovely golden color that is her color, she becomes like a, a statue made of gold. And she seems to be in a state of, of trance, totally concentrated, no movement. Hmm? She looks like a stone, a stone of God, something divine, lit by an amethyst soul, as if in the center of this stone, glowing out, is this light of the soul. Amethyst is a color. It's a very, very beautiful color. It's a stone, of course. It's a gem stone. A gem stone which I think Mother says it has the the meaning of protection or the quality of protection. And, um, but it's the color, it's a, a deep blue and at the same time purple, violet. A deep violet blue. It's a beautiful word and it's a beautiful color. Dana Lakshmi. Thank you. So, it's not only that she is still deeply, concentratedly still, everything grows still around her. She's surrounded by silence and her heart can just hear its own beats and her mind falls <coughs> completely silent and receptive. It, it is listening, it heard and was mute. It doesn't speak or respond, it's just listening to that voice. What does the voice say? Lela. Why camest thou to this dumb death bounder, this ignorant light <coughs> in different skies, tied like a sacrifice on the altar of time? O spirit, O mortal energy, <coughs> give to us in this grief in a helpless heart, 
and work hard to turn the stories away from doing. The rise of soul and vanquish time and death. Mm. Thank you. So here again we have this thou and thee and thy, which we don't use in ordinary English speech or even writing nowadays. This is the second person singular. So if I want to talk in this old-fashioned way, I will address Mahalingam, oh Mahalingam, how art thou today? How goest it with thee? No? It's an, an old form of the language which we use only in special occasions. But here, throughout the poem, Sri Aurobindo uses it when one person is speaking to another. One other person. So the voice says to Savitri, it calls her, O oh spirit, you are a spiritual being. You are an immortal energy, a deathless energy. Why have you come down to this earth, this earth which is dumb, which cannot express itself, which is in the grip of death. Hmm? Why have you come down into this ignorant life which seems to take place beneath indifferent skies, not <coughs> conscious skies, material skies that don't take any interest in what is happening on the earth. It's as if you have come down and you, or maybe it's the earth, is tied like a sacrifice on the altar of time. This idea that the earth life is a sacrifice to the gods. And so that sacrifice gets tied, if it's an animal or something that's offered, gets tied and put on the altar. No? This life is something like that. Why have you come if you're only going to sit there and nurse grief in a helpless heart? Here on line 25, you look at the second line, a second word. It says, if twas. So there's, a, there's an apostrophe that shows that a letter has been missed out. So this is standing for if it was. If it was only to just nurse grief as if it's your child here in your helpless heart. Or wait for your doom for the death of Satyavan with your hard, tearless eyes, just waiting. Is that what you came for? The voice asks her, and then it tells her, wake up, O soul, and overcome, conquer time and death. You are stronger and time and death. You are an immortal spirit and energy. Wake up and do what you have come to do. Hmm? Tamarai, please. Make sound, please. Heart, Replied. Replied. In the thing, night, my, start, stem, is taken from me and to death. Yes. So, she starts her answer. This is not Savitri's soul which is replying. This is her heart. Hmm? 
and she says, my strength has been taken away from me. As if her strength is in her love for Satyavan and now Satyavan is going to be taken away. That's been given into the power of death. And then um, it asks, uh, Joel, you will read. Why should I lift my hands to the shut heavens or struggle with mute inevitable fate or hope in vain to uplift an ignorant race <coughs> who hug their lot and mock the Savior light and see in mine wisdom's soul tabernacle in its harsh heat and its inconscient base a rock of safety and an anchor of sleep. Yes. So she says, why should I lift my hands to the shut heavens? Why should I pray there when the heavens are closed? Why should I struggle with fate which is inevitable? Why should I hope in vain, it's useless to hope to uplift this ignorant race of human beings who hug their lot. They hold on to it. They cling to it. And they don't believe in the Savior light. They mock it. They think it has no power or it doesn't exist this ignorant race of human beings, they think that mind is the only place uh, where wisdom can be found. A tabernacle is a shrine, like a sacred place. So the only place where mind can, where wisdom can be worshipped is in mind. And uh, the summit of mind, she says, is something harsh. People who live very much in their um, in the abstract mind, they don't seem to be much in touch with their hearts, with any warmer feelings. No? And the, the base of mind is something inconscient, without consciousness. The base of matter. But these human beings see this as a, a rock of safety, where they can hold on to something unchanging and an anchor of sleep. They can anchor themselves to this rock of matter and fall asleep. <clears throat> so why should I make that effort? A lady at the back, would you like to read? Is there a God who may be quite He sits in peace and leaves the mortal strength. Important against this calm omnipotent law, and then conscious, in conscience, and the Almighty comes of death. Yes. So she says, this is following on from this, why should I lift my hands to the shut heavens? She says, is there at all a God who listens to anybody's prayers? No? God is sitting in peace there and he doesn't help us. He leaves the human strength, the mortal strength, helpless against his law. He has this all-powerful law. It doesn't change. We can only obey it. No? He leaves us helpless against the law of matter, the inconscience, and he leaves us helpless against the all-powerful hands of death. So why will I pray
to him. Mm. Uma, you like to read? Yes, thank you. So then she uh, asks the voice, what, why would I need to avoid this black meshed net of death, no? this dismal door of death? And why would Satyavan need to avoid that if I'm an immortal spirit? Why would I need to avoid the door of death? It is nothing to fear. No? And why would I need to try to call a greater light into this closed room of human life and to call a greater law into man's little world? That is the mission that she's actually come with, no? To call a mightier light and to bring a, a greater law. And that's what the, the voice told her to do. Wake up, conquer time and death. But the human heart is replying, why do I need to do that? Hmm? Uh, Tatiana. Why should I strive for earth's unyielding walls or stay for death's inevitable hour? This surely is best to practice, to practice, 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 I think. Yes. <clears throat> she says the laws of earth, of matter, are unyielding. They won't give way. I can't change those laws. They are not changeable. Why should I struggle and strive with them? And why should I try to stave off? It means to delay. We will have to die sometime. Death's hour is inevitable. Why should I try to delay it? Surely the best thing for me to do is to make a compromise, make a, a pact, an agreement with my fate. And when Satyavan dies, I will follow him. I will follow close behind my lover's steps and with him I will pass through the night of death through twilight to the sun to the the bright light of the immortal countries I will cross over with him the tenebrous river the shadowy river that divides earth and heaven and she says earth and heaven are adjoining parishes a parish is a, a small an, an area an administrative area hmm? a, a, a small district and these are adjoining districts earth and heaven they are separated by this shadowy river of death so I will just cross over with him. They are just two uh, territories very close together. Why do I need to avoid 
that. Hmm? Mahalingam. Then could we lie in our <coughs> breast of one breast, untroubled by thought, untroubled by our thoughts, forgetting man and life and death and its hours, forgetting eternity is called, forgetting God. Hmm, yes, she says. Then if I follow him like that, there we can be lie embracing forever, untroubled by any thought, untroubled by any unhappiness. We can forget all about man and life and time. We can forget about the earth. Then she admits it will be forgetting the call of eternity and forgetting about God. Venkat. The voice replied, Is this enough? O spirit, and, and what shall thy soul say when it wakes and knows the work was left undone for which it came? Yes, then the, the voice challenges her. Is that enough for you to follow Satyavan into death and be peace at peace? What will your soul say when it wakes up and knows that you've left the world without doing the work for which it came? It came here with a mission. You really want to go back and without having done the work? Bhuvana? Is this all for that we born on earth? Charged with the mandate from eternity, a listener to the voices of the ears, a follower of the footprints of the gods, to pass and leave unchanged the old destiny lost. Yes. Is this all that uh, you have been born on earth for? You have actually been born here charged with a mandate. Here in Oroville we know about mandates, no? The working groups have mandates. They have particular tasks which they are supposed to do. You've been charged with a mandate from eternity. You've been given a mission, no? And after all, your being is a very highly developed being. It's a listener, it can hear the voices of the years, the significance of time. You are a follower in the footprints of the gods. You follow the ways of the divine beings. Are you really going to come like any other human being? Come and go away and leave unchanged the old laws. And it says those old dusty laws, they are dusty, outdated. It's time for them to change. Hmm? Alice. Shall there be no new tables, no new word, no greater light come down upon the earth, delivering her from her own? Yes. New tables, it means new laws. Laws are written on stone, tablets of stone. No? If you go away like that, you're going to leave it like that? No new laws, no new word of creation, no greater light for the earth that will help to free her from her unconsciousness, help to liberate matter, and that will, a new word that will deliver, set free man's spirit from unalterable fate. At the moment, man's spirit is in the grip of ignorance and death, but that's what you came to change, no? So, are you going to go away and leave it all 
just the same. There were Came's thou not down? Did you not come down on earth in order to open those closed doors of fate, those iron doors that seem to be closed forever? You've come with that mandate from eternity to change something, no? Didn't you come down to lead man to truths? wide and golden road, that wide and golden road of truth that leads through finite things, through all these limited things made of matter that we have here in the material world. Truth's road leads through all this towards eternity. Isn't that what you came to do. Hmm? Thou camest, you came, and then it's here, it's in the form of a question. Camest thou not down? Didn't you come down in order to open the doors of fate? Suresh. Is this the, the report that I must make? my head power, which shall before the eternal say, his power he kindled in the body has failed, his love returns at us under Yes, so the voice says, is, you're going to make me go back and stand before the Lord and tell him I would have to bow my head with shame, I'd be ashamed to tell him that the power which he has kindled, we kindle a fire, a fire that he has lit in your human body has failed, it's failed and gone out and your soul is just returning, his laborer is going to return without having completed her task. No? I, I, are you going to force me to make this report going back to the Lord? No? Then Savitri's heart fell mute, it spoke no word, it doesn't say anything, fall silent. But holding back her troubled rebel heart, abrupt, erect and strong, calm like a hill, surmounting the seas of mortal ignorance, its peak immutable above mind's air, a power within her answered the still voice. So the heart falls silent, but there's another power within Savitri which controls holds back, like holding back a horse, that troubled, rebellious heart. No? That power is suddenly there, abrupt, it stands upright, it's strong, it's calm, like a hill, steady. It rises above, it surmounts, it rises up above the seas of mortal ignorance which she was suffering from in her human state. The peak of that hill or the 
peak of that power is unchangeable. Above the air, the atmosphere of mind, this power within her answers the still voice. And it says, I am thy portion here, charged with thy work, as thou myself seated forever above. Speak to my depths, O great and deathless voice. Command, for I am here to do thy will. So this is an inner power which replies. No? And it says, I am part of you. I am thy portion here in the human being, charged with thy work. I've been given, it's your work that I've been given to do. I'm here to do your work. And you, O oh voice, you are myself. You are the voice of my higher self. The myself, this part of myself which is always seated above, firm and unchanging. And she says, speak to my depths, to the deeper parts of me. O oh, great and deathless voice, command, give your command, tell me what to do, because that's why I'm here. I'm here to do what you want me to do, thy will. So we will stop there for today. We can read these lines together. As in the vigilance of the sleepless night, through the slow, heavy-footed, silent hours, Repressing in her bosom its load of grief. She sat staring at the dumb tread of time and the approach of ever nearing fate. A summons from her being's summit came, a sound a call that broke the seals of night. Above her brows, where will and knowledge meet, a mighty voice invaded mortal space. It seemed to come from inaccessible heights and yet was intimate with all the world and knew the meaning of the steps of time and saw eternal destinies, changeless seen, filling the far prospect of the cosmic gaze. As the voice touched, her body became a stark and rigid golden statue of motionless trance, a stone of God lit by an amethyst soul. Around her body's stillness all grew still. Her heart listened 
to its slow measured beats her mind renouncing thought heard and was mute why camest thou to this dumb death bound earth this ignorant life beneath indifferent skies tied like a sacrifice on the altar of time o spirit o immortal energy if twas to nurse grief in a helpless heart or with hard tearless eyes await thy doom arise o soul and vanquish time and death but savitri's heart replied in the dim night my strength is taken from me and given to death why should i lift my hands to the shut heavens or struggle with mute inevitable fate or hope in vain to uplift an ignorant race who hug their lot and mock the saviour light and see in mind wisdom's soul tabernacle in its harsh peak and its inconscient base a rock of safety and an anchor of sleep is there a god whom any cry can move he sits in peace and leaves the mortal's strength impotent against his calm omnipotent law and inconscience and the almighty hands of death what need have i what need has satyavan to avoid the black meshed net the dismal door or call a mightier light into life's closed room a greater law into man's little world why should i strive with earth's unyielding laws or stave off death's inevitable hour this surely is best to pactize with my fate and follow close behind my lover's steps and pass through night from twilight to the sun across the tenebrous river that divides the adjoining parishes of earth and heaven then could we lie in armed breast upon breast untroubled by thought untroubled by our hearts forgetting man and life and time and its hours forgetting eternity's call forgetting god the voice replied 
Is this enough, O spirit? And what shall thy soul say when it wakes and knows the work was left undone for which it came? Or is this all for thy being born on earth, charged with a mandate from eternity, a listener to the voices of the years, a follower of the footprints of the gods, to pass and leave unchanged the old dusty laws? Shall there be no new tables, no new word, no greater light come down upon the earth, delivering her from her unconsciousness, man's spirit from unalterable fate? Camest thou not down to open the doors of fate, the iron doors that seemed forever closed, and lead man to truth's wide and golden road that runs through finite things to eternity? Is this then the report that I must make, my head bowed with shame before the eternal seat, his power he kindled in thy body has failed, his laborer returns, her task undone? Then Savitri's heart fell mute. It spoke no word. But holding back her troubled rebel heart, abrupt, erect and strong, calm like a hill, surmounting the seas of mortal ignorance, its peak immutable above mind's air, a power within her answered the still voice. I am thy portion here, charged with thy work, as thou myself seated for ever above. Speak to my depths, O great and deathless voice. Command, for I am here to do thy will.